You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now Sam Hankin. Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader, brought to you by WSB, Wellington Square Bookshop, winner of the Philly Hot List, best bookstore in the uh, Philadelphia area, and somewhat more arcanely, we are the winner of the Mainline Today's Best Non-Corporate Coffee Shop. Don't know exactly what that means, but I'm very happy about it. I'm happy because it's my bookshop. Anyway, today we are lucky and pleased to have with us Mandy Aftel, respected perf- perfumer or perfumier and author of Essence and Alchemy, uh, Aroma and Sense and Sensibilities. That's three books. She also wrote Death of a Rolling Stone, the Brian Jones story, which is close to me because I always thought he was a flawed genius, and I just finished reading uh, Keith Richards' uh, autobiography. And she's also been a a psychotherapist, uh, so she's had a very interesting career. Today she's here to discuss her latest work, Fragrant, uh, The Secret Life of Scent. It was just published last week by Riverhead. Quick thumbnail of the book, I can use the metaphors she uses and that wine connoisseurs and uh, music lovers and uh, perfume lovers use, and it's funny because all those senses kind of meld together. The book itself has top notes, which are the ways in which she brings you into the book to tell you little things that are cute and funny and anecdotal. And then there are the middle notes, which is where it's real, the, the guts of the book, which tells you Uh, how these odors and scents and fragrances originated, the histories behind them, actual recipes, which are really cool in there, illustrations, uh, which are fascinating. And then there are the bottom notes, which to me are the ones um, that sometimes are most important. They're the ones that stay with you. And and those notes are the notes that tell the story of how closely melded our sense of smell is to our own, our very existence. The fact that the olfactory bulbs that we use to sense those things that are so important to us, uh, the feeling of home or the feeling of Halloween when you smell burning leaves, um, those things, you know, generated from the limbic system up through the olfactory bulbs, which then eventually evolutionarily became the, the prefrontal cortex. So there's a whole bunch of lots of things in this, and I, I can't wait to start talking to Mandy about it. So, so welcome, Mandy. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I always like to go through a couple of things. First of all, uh, since we were talking about it before the show, um, you have a great dedication to uh, your partner in the book, uh, and uh, it, it, it derives from a Greek myth. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, it was amazing, this myth that I found. It was to illustrate mint, and um, it's just a, a wonderful story. It's from Ovid, and it's about... Um, these very uh, poor people, couple, old couple, called Bauschus and Philemon. And um, the, in a disguised way, these uh, very important gods, Zeus and Hermes, come down from Mount Olympus to this town where Bauschus and Philemon live. And they knock on all these doors and no one wants to feed them or deal with them at all. And Bauschus and Philemon, who have this, you know, hovel, um, invite them in. And they make them you know, a really nice dinner. But they do this kind of wonderful thing, which is they wipe the table with mint to kind of uh, you know, celebrate and, um, and make welcome, which is how mint has been used in people's life to make them welcome. So they, they, uh, they rub the table with mint. They give them this kind of wonderful meal. And, um, and it kind of pays to be hospitable and fragrant because um, later... Uh, um, Zeus and Hermes are angry with the town and the people in it, and they basically wipe it out in a flood. <laughs> and they um, and they only let Bauschus and Philemon live, and they turn their home into a little temple and so on. And then they're so in love, Bauschus and Philemon, they're offered this uh, wish from the gods. What would they like? And they said, well, they would like to die together. They don't want to live one minute without the other one. And so when they die, they become one tree with two roots. Yeah, it's fascinating because it is a great story. And then at the end of it, you go, hey, wait a minute. I thought this was a book about smell and perfume and fragrances. And then you go back and you realize that the the germ, uh, the kernel, which you yeah. talk about a lot in your book too, and essentially, it starts from that idea, the concept of hospitality, of mint. And why is it, you know, it's funny, owning an independent bookstore, uh, 
I put books on my iPad. I, in fact, I, you know, I, I do it all the time because I have this radio show. But people tell me countless times how much they love holding the book in their hand. Yes. And I, I always equate it to the idea of candles and yes. the, the scent of candles. Yes. And, and, and when the when the light bulb came out, the candle makers union was like, you know, this is, you know, we shouldn't use those. They're going to explode, burn your house down. But eventually, it became there is no actual need, as you the one quote you have from uh, Gaston it says, there's no need for man. There's yeah. he's a, he's a, a luxury essentially, um, right. a creature of desire. Yeah. And, and and so there was no need for candles now, not even for emergencies because they have all these LED lights you put on your head and all. But yes. if you go into Pier 1 Imports, the whole store, half the store is candles. Yes. When, when's the last yes. time you went to one of the restaurants where you, you, you know, you you live across from one? Where, yes. How yes. could you go in there without there being a candle on the table? Yes. Well, you know, it, it's very interesting to deal with smell, uh, as I do, both writing about it, reading about it, and, and, and I have a small artisanal perfume line, so I, I work with the materials all the time. And, you know, we are such creatures of of deep desires and sensuality and um, and smells and they bring such amazing pleasure into our lives and you know long ago um, you know people you know sailed the wrong way around the world just to get their hands on spices you know that the, the aromatics and, and and what they related to in people's lives how much people wanted them and and valued them when they were far away and or even nearby and included them in their lives is something that um, just brings really brings a lot of pleasure, and I I love to kind of turn people on to that. Well, it's funny because you know, the book is about a specific subject, but when you start thinking about it, if you start thinking about the spice root, the spice root created in a in a great amount uh, the the world we live in today, because yeah. without the spice root, a lot of exp un territory would have remained unexplored. People wouldn't have communicated with one another. And it was all because of this, what is still considered in some ways a luxury. Yes. Well, the spi you know, people were really, really captivated by spices. And the stories about them were so fascinating. In a way, I started writing this book because I gave a talk at the Natural History Museum in New York on the spice route, and I could not believe what I was finding when I was doing my research. I mean, it was so exciting to me. Um, to talk about you know the aromatic the aromatic qualities, but also how vivid and alive those spices were, and how much people wanted them in their lives. How much they cooked with them, they wore them. You know, they sailed off in the wrong direction to get them. How you know you could trade uh, you know a sheep for some ginger. It was just very romantic and exciting. Kind of lives on in your imagination when you smell something kind of as incredible as cinnamon. Yeah, and I like the one passage where you talk about if you can actually find it in this in the curled, the curled shape. You know, the curled leaves like uh, uh, pencil shavings. Yes. Because I remember when I was a little, my mother showing me those, and I was just so fascinated. And then when I smelled it, it was like, how could yes. anything smell like this? <laughs> well, that's an oil I use. It's Virginia cedar wood, and it's it comes from making pencils. Oh. But that that aromatic quality that kind of threads through life, which I chose these five kind of rock stars to illustrate how deep they go with us as people and how easy it is to get back in touch with that now and the pleasure that it brings through cooking, through gardening, through so many things in your life. It's just hard not to be turned on by it. You know, actually, this would be a good point then to basically uh, describe the skeleton of your book and, and what the five rock stars are of scent and, and, and how you chose them. Um, I, I chose them. Uh, I'm very excited about them. Um, you know, I, you, st you start working on a book, and and I'm a, a really like the original source of things. It was how I ended up writing about Brian Jones. I kind of like to go, you know, to to the source and find out what's going on. So I love doing research for this book. It's got like 150 books at least in its bibliography, and I I started to think about the world that I'm in and how aromatic it is and all the pleasure I get from it from I must say natural aromatics not synthetic ones that they bring so much pleasure in my life and I love knowing the backstory I love you know having this thing in my hand that has this incredibly rich history it brings a lot of meaning and just really a lot of sensual pleasure so the five of them in the book are cinnamon and I'll come back to them but I'll just 
you know, rattle them off. Mm -hmm. Cinnamon, then mint, then frankincense, then ambergris, then jasmine. So one of the things I realized about these five particular essences or aromatics is that they're deeply connected to these long-standing, historical, very rich human appetites. So cinnamon, I felt, was connected to our desire for things that are exotic, that are far away, that we bring back from somewhere, and also about luxury. The spices were absolute luxury in their day. And people, you know, made beaten crowns out of cinnamon. Um, they traveled around the world to be able to get their hands on it. They used the scent of that at banquets along with perfumed doves. It was a very big part of their lives. It wasn't used to retire, re retard spoilage. It was used because people loved the smells of them and the richness of them. So, there, so cinnamon, to me, was kind of the titan of the spice trade. Then kind of the opposite of it is mint, which is all about what's close to home, what's underfoot, about the smells of home and hospitality. And that, you know, it just kind of blew my mind what I found out about cinnamon, which is there was a huge, uh, excuse me, mint industry here in America. And that as the pioneers were moving across to the West, a lot of them had cinnamon with them, or the peddlers or the hawkers and the walkers, as they were called, brought cinnamon west. In the middle of the country, there was this huge mint industry, which was, you know, pop, you know popularized by Wrigley's gum and, and uh, mint toothpaste, and it was this kind of smell of home. And when someone comes to your home, you often will offer them mint tea or, uh, you know, a mint or chocolate mint or chewing gum, because mint is so deeply intertwined with our desire to make someone feel at home and the smell of home. Then the next one is frankincense, which is about our deep connection to transcendence and spirituality and to trees. And frankincense is a resin that is in a tree. If you kind of scrape this tree, the resin just pops right out of it. It's the, kind of the lifeblood of the tree. And so many spiritual traditions have used frankincense, you know, starting with, you know, Jesus. Uh, but I mean, actually not starting with Jesus. Jesus was kind of in the middle of it, the birth of Jesus and people bringing things to him. To Are you, you know, let me interrupt you for one second, because I had yes. this feeling when I was reading the book, I thought, Mandy is the only person I know who could, without leaving her house, put in a bag the same three things that the wise men brought to Jesus. And I feel so lucky about that. <laughs> but isn't that amazing? I, Who else could do it's that? A, it's ama you know, I have a little part in the book where I feel so excited that I'm using the stuff that was in the Bible. It's just, it's very thrilling to me on this whole other level. I'm just so excited to touch it and to know it's had that history and that it's in my hands, too. I just feel connected well, to people all the way back just through these aromatics. So with frankincense, what I, I, I found, it was so fascinating, was a whole history of incense. And incense started, I mean, before people were burning things for incense, of which frankincense is kind of a major, major one that's done, they were like burning blood sacrifice, uh, in which mercifully they moved on to incense and burning incense after that. And um, they felt that the coils of the smoke was a way to reach God, you know, that those coils of incense smoke were, were both the way to heaven, because it rose to heaven, but also pleasing to God, that things godly and things transcendent had beautiful smells. So there's these fascinating stories about incense and its role in our lives. For example, geishas would mark off their time when they were with a customer on an incense stick. So they'd burn it, and they'd know how long it would last, and then they would uh, be able to use that for telling time. Just very charming details like that. So the next one, should I go on? Would oh, yeah. Like, yeah, this yeah. is great. Okay, the, ne the next one in the book is ambergris. Because ambergris that is, is my favorite one. That's why I wanted you to go on. <laughs> ambergris is all about the human appetite for wonder and curiosity. You know, things that are just strange and weird and interesting and multifaceted, and you go, oh, wow, that's just so cool. So long ago, um, people used to collect all kinds of natural wonders, and they put them in these things called cabinets of curiosity. And they often had scented material in them along with all sorts of odd stuff, and they were the forerunners for our Natural History Museum. So that chapter has a lot of different animal smells in it, um, a smell
pals of us as humans, as animals, and uh, a, a little animal called the hyrax, which has uh, puts its poop out, is interesting. But every- wait, wait, let me stop you again. I'll I'll, go, I'll take you right back to where you were. Two things I wanted to talk about was one, um, what you're yeah. you're um, equating the cabinet of curiosities to Pinterest today. I thought that yeah. was really cool, and oh, also the fact you. that 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 part you should uh, be proud that that part of your book was kind of excerpted, right? Yes, yes. Oh my God! Yes, yes. Yesterday on the on Discover, I was, and they had such great pictures. I was thrilled, <laughs> very thrilled. You know, I set the chapter up like a cabinet. So you'd like open this drawer, and you'd find this interesting fact about scented butterflies, and then you'd open another door, and there'd be stuff about mummies. And so the main one in the chapter, the one it's built around, is is ambergris, which comes from the sperm whale. And it, it, it's uh, poop, actually. Uh, it's, it's something they have trouble digesting, and if they cannot get it out of their body, it's very bad for them. So it comes out, and it looks a bit like a pumice stone, like a lightweight stone. And it can be quite huge, and it washes around on the, on the ocean and lands on the beach. And there are just these incredibly interesting stories about, you know, people finding it. I, I, I don't know if you saw that story about the couple in Australia, where they uh, they see this like lump on the beach, and um, they think I forgot what they thought it was. They thought it was something very weird, but it kind of bothered them. They went home, then they went back, uh, and they decided finally to take it and put it in the car. I guess it was pretty just odd looking. It's like a big old rock, and you know to make a long story short, they sold it for a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah, I know. I that story was amazing. The fact that they. I was worried when you were telling the story that when they came back, it wasn't going to be there anymore. Me too. Me too. (laughs) It's just, it's full of lore. I mean, it's just endlessly fascinating. I mean, people used to think when they would see this stuff floating on the shore, because it's very ancient, that there were like dragons under the sea, and they were like doing things, or mushrooms. I mean, the stories themselves are so charming, until they worked out what that stuff was, and it's unearthly beautiful smell. Well, it's funny when that, that one story about how it's dragon spittle that this comes. I, yes. I, I like that because it seems kind of logical, you know. If you yes. think of dragons in your mind, it yes. kind of seems like okay. Well, that kind of makes sense. Oh, they thought it was a cyst. That's what they thought. They thought it was a tumor. They thought it was, is that, yeah, they thought it was. A, I keep thinking like, what kind of cyst would be on the beach? <laughs> Very strange, but such a fantastic, kind of just thrilling, curious, wonderful story. So my last, uh, the last one in the book is Jasmine. And it's about the human appetite for beauty, which I think is really so special and so important in people's lives to have something, have beauty in your life every day. And and by that, I don't mean something expensive. I mean something that just you look at or you taste or you smell or you touch and you think, oh, this is is just beautiful. So one of the uh, ways of thinking about beauty that was so important to me as a perfumer is the Japanese idea called wabi-sabi, which is all about imperfection and things aging and things coming and then going away, which to me is the perfect definition of a smell, and in particular a fragrance, where it's there and then it's not there. And so I you know, wrote a lot about in the last chapter about ways that beauty is just so restorative to people and that how absolutely beautiful jasmine is, and that jasmine really is kind of a reconciliation of opposites. It's both uh, floral and fecal, um, which is slightly shocking, but it has this kind of yin and yang, kind of sweet, putrid smell, and it's all about the idea that beauty incorporates some ugliness, some unlastingness in its beauty. Why is it that... that's that's it. Why is it that um, you give that quote where it's something like, there is no perfume without jasmine? which apparently yes. is someone, every, something everyone in your trade knows. Yes. Um, but if it's so, I mean, I love the smell of jasmine. I'm, I, I mean, I guess everybody does. And yes. But it is, to me, although you say otherwise, it is overpowering. And so it seems like if you have to have a base that, of a perfume that starts with jasmine, and I know how you, I, I know how you very uh, clearly explain how you construct these things, but it seems like it would be hard to overpower the base of jasmine. Well, it's it's it, it, it's a very good question, and what it means about no perfume without jasmine is that's an old saying, and it refers to I think older floral perfumes. In other words, I make perfumes that don't have jasmine in them. So your 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 comment is completely correct. 
you know, jasmine and rose are kind of the, the you know, the, the linchpins of perfumes. They're, they're in so many perfumes. But it, if you're making something and you do have jasmine in it, it can float around in the background and do magical things to other essences, and you wouldn't know it was in there if it's dosed very lightly. It's very possible to play with, as you would in cooking. Cooking's just the best analogy. To put something in there that's just a little bit on the edge that you barely perceive but has a good effect on the other ingredients. Yeah, it's interesting the way you talk about, I think towards the beginning of the book, about how you talk about, now, I didn't like that it smelled a bit like old lady perfume. And, yeah. and I was thinking, well, I know what that smells like. And I was, how do I know what old lady perfume smells like? And I realized, okay, that's the perfume I smelled on my aunts when I was little. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but so what What do you wear? And do you change what you wear? I, I wear, um, I wear the, usually, as is probably a disappointment, um, I wear the last thing I've made. I'm very interested in, the, in going forward with what I create. So I like to wear, the newest thing is the most interesting to me because I've been working on it, it's in my mind. And the older things are less interesting to me, although I do have uh, one I go back to all the time that was very important to me, I wear it, it's called sepia. And um, it's not, I would not say it's the most popular perfume in my line by a long shot. And if someone called me up and asked to suggest a perfume, I would probably never suggest that one. But it, it's the one I like the best. Uh, it's very strange, and I made it, um, I make my perfumes because I'm moved by some emotional experience in my life, and I want to capture it in scent the way that someone would capture something in, say, in painting or in music. It's, it's, it's about that for me when I'm creating. And I was very, very moved by the ghost towns in the gold rush in California, in Northern California. And I, I drove around for a long time and looked at the towns and looked at the ruins, and I wanted to make a perfume that kind of captured that period of time and the loss of it and old things that disappear and go away and, um, and the, re- the remains that are left behind. So that perfume for me is all about, it smells, I think, like old wood. I find that for me about smell, you know, I, can't, I can't think of the others, but just around one sense of smell and aging. I do know that I read that it goes away, but I find when you become more conscious of it and you exercise it more and you think about it more, it's there more. I think in a way it's more possible to have a better sense of smell as you get older rather than worse because I think smelling goes on so unconsciously that once you start to derive the pleasure from it and do some of the things that I mentioned in the book, which is shop for your food with your nose, like smell everything. I think it's like a little muscle in there. I think the more you use it, the more nuanced it becomes. And I think also people don't use their sense of smell except to say, I like it, I don't like it. And I think when you bring that sense of wonder to your sense of smell, then it's just interesting. It just becomes interesting, and it's something you want to do. Like one of the things I do, which, you know, might seem completely weird, is, you know, if I smell a skunk, I will roll the window down. I mean, I'm just completely interested in that. I mean, I wouldn't want to be sprayed <laughs> with it. But when I can smell something like, like that going on, I, I, first of all, I take my hat off to how strong it is. And secondly, I think it's just an interesting smell. So I want to smell stuff. So I haven't found that to be the case, but it's because I'm so involved in it all the time. It gives me so much information. Yeah, it's like that one story you told where the guy mistakenly got the bag, the scent of skunk instead of a uh, fox. Oh, my God. Hey, tell that, that tell story. The, tell the story because that's what you're that talking about. That story was so interesting. I could, not, I could not believe the buried treasures I found. Um, it was a story about a trapper uh, who was going to trap with the Indians, I think, in Alaska. And he wrote this unbelievably charming story about... Uh, what he did and so to make you know to to make the story kind of not too long he um he decided you know they use trappers have used um almost perfume and 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 animal smells as lures to trap other animals and so he got skunk and he he recognized you know how incredibly fragrant to put it mildly it was so he buried it in a million ways you know in his trunk and in his uh, in in in, uh, in his trunk and in bags and in bags and bags and 
whatever. Anyways, I, I think it froze, as I recall. It froze. Yeah. And then he, um, so he could smell it. And, and I know myself, because I, I once had um, a, a, a bit of skunk. It's, it's unbelievably strong. It was so, so strong. So he's going up to you know, meet with these Indians. You know, he wants to make a good impression. He's going to teach them some things. They're going to teach him some things. The smell is beyond. So he decides what he's going to do is he's going to bury it. He digs a hole. He buries it, and then they come up with their dogs, with their sled dogs. And the first things the dogs do is dig it up. And he's just horrified, and the smell is all over the town. How is there so much strength and power, power. and concentration you know, in that? I, I think that's an amazing question that I do not know the answer to. But it is really, really strong. It's, um, it's funny, when we were talking about the loss of the being able to smell, there was just a study I read before I started reading your book that just came out that said that um, they found that people whose senses of smell deteriorate live less. They, they live a shorter period that. of time. Did I you saw say? that. Yeah. I thought and that was fascinating. I wondered myself when I saw, I saw it too. I wondered truly if they kind of worked on it more, if things could be different. I mean, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know the answers to those things, but I kind of wondered. Yeah, as did I. I mean, you know, you may not be a scientist, but you are kind of essentially a chemist, right? <laughs> Well, I, I, I know my way around my materials. I mean, my high school chemistry teacher would probably turn over in a grave to hear I was a chemist. <laughs> I mean, truly. Mine too. I was not a star chemistry student. But, yeah, you're definitely hands-on, so that's what, you know, it's like being an auto mechanic. You may not be able to design a, a, a car, but you can fix it, you know? Well, I'm fascinated, you know. I'm so fascinated by the materials. Uh, everything for me starts with the materials. I'm, my perfumes, my writing... I, I'm just in love with them, and I've been in love with them for almost 20 years now, and so excited to share them with people and to share them with people through the book that I, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to not be energized by things you're in love with. How do you think you've stayed so idealistic, in a sense, you know, so, so passionately involved in this for such a long period of time? It sounds like you just started doing this yesterday, and you're so in love with it. You know, I, I've, got, I've kept my business very small. I'm very hands-on. I do everything myself, so I don't make compromises. Uh, I, I, and I feel privileged and lucky, particularly with my book and my perfumes, to do things in a way that are pleasing to me. It is very energizing. And I've kind of stayed um, away from larger things that would cause me to do stuff that I would find boring or you know, not to my liking. So I, I stay small, and it's been, I've been very lucky that people have found their way to me and um, like some of what I do, and so I kind of live in this bubble. Well, it's funny. Yeah. Well, actually, that's, that's a great way to close. One of the things my father used to say was, you know, if you wake up in the morning and you want to go to work, you know, you're oh. living a pretty good life. I wake up in the morning. I want to go to work. I go to sleep. I don't, I, I don't want to go to sleep. I'm, <laughs> I, I love it, and, you know, I'm so honored to be able to, you know, work with Riverhead and do this book and to share this with people. I'm really, I really feel very, very lucky. Well, and I feel lucky to have read it because I probably, simply because of the, the guy thing, I probably wouldn't have bought a book yes. about perfume, if, if you will. And yes. I'm so glad that I, that uh, my producer found it and I'm so glad that I read it oh. and so glad that I talked to you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll have it. And, you know, if you ever get east, if you ever get outside of Philadelphia. I will. Come by our bookstore. To your bookstore. That'd be I would great. Love to do that. Okay, uh, let's say goodbye, and then I'll, hi I'll we'll hang on. You, we can talk about the order that I placed. Yes. Okay. Please, right. please hold on one minute. Okay. Hey, Foster, there's a problem. He ordered. I'm off now. He ordered last night. There's no order there. I don't see his order. I have an email. I can tell you. I can show you. He got an email too. Tell me what your name is. Samuel Hankin. Yeah, I don't see you here. Really? Hold on. I'm going to put Foster on because he does. The, he knows how to do the orders on the internet better than me. I wonder if he did it when we crashed. Yeah, it it says here's. I, I got it last night at 10:26. It says thank you for your I'm order. Give you to, I'm going to give you the phone. Okay. No, he did it. Here he is. This is him. Yeah, I have an order number. It's one two two nine. It shipped. Oh no. No, no, it is shipping. Today. But I, 
Oh, it hasn't shipped? Ship. No, oh. no. Yeah. Okay. All right. Wait. I'll, I'll, I'm going to go see what you ordered then. It's here. Thank <laughs> God. See, shows you, shows you I don't take care of that part of the business. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But, oh, my God, I'm embarrassed. It's, uh, um, it's, you'll, you'll let me know, though, when it comes out. I'm going to go look at your order because I have to go do another radio interview, so I'm going to get in the car and, and go. But I want to just make sure because they're going to send your order today. Okay, Sponsor great. Home. Well, this... So I'll look and see what you've got there. Okay, excellent. Okay, thank you so much. And also, email me if you have any questions about, you know, what you got or... I will, and, if, and if so the tease... Are... my email, I'm Mandy at com. I got that. I, I looked at your entire website, which is wonderful and great oh. pictures. And you can tell how nice you are and how much you like what you do by that one picture with all your your table. It looks like you, like you even talked about it. It's like you're playing a pipe organ. You know, it looks I like... Am ha- I, I am a happy girl. That's I'm great. I'm. It's just. It makes you happy just to t- to talk to someone like you. So anyway. Thank, well, thank you so very much, and let me know because I will promote it for sure. Okay, that sounds great. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, perhaps the most enthusiastic of our uh, authors that I've ever had, and I was enthusiastic too because, it really, is a great book. Um, like I said, it's not a. Well, I, I enjoyed reading it because there was a lot of science in it. You know, I like science, and so the science of perfume, the science of scent, the science of. What makes us all tick? The evolution of our species and how the olfactory bulbs gave rise to the neocortex. All that stuff was uh, incredibly interesting to me. It's a very good book, and her website, um, Mandy Aftel's perfume website, um, is excellent, and it, it makes you want to go out and buy her perfume. The testing um, uh, kits you can buy from her with little tiny bits of the perfume are really inexpensive. The perfume itself is expensive, but not nearly as much as you'd find in, say, Neiman Marcus or someplace like that. And uh, I imagine, and I'll find out, what the things smell like. But she's a wonderful woman, and uh, I really enjoyed speaking with her. And then next week, and I may have introduced him at a past show, and then somehow it got canceled or mixed up, but this time he's really going to be here, is Theodore Gray. And again, it's science, and I'm really, really happy about this because he wrote the book called The Elements, which is beautifully illustrated and really funny and really informative. It's also an app on um, at the Apple uh, application store, and it's called The Elements. It's You pay for it, but it's the best application I've ever seen. It's just b- beautiful and well done. It would be great for any parent who has a child who likes science, uh, for anyone who's in high school or college and has uh, science classes. It's a distillation, if you will, of the periodic table. It goes through each element, describes it perfectly, both in terms of things as simple as atomic weight and atomic number, but then also things about what it looks like, what it smells like, what it tastes like, if it's poison, if it's not poisonous, what can be made out of it, what its uses are. So now he's written a second book called Molecules, uh, The Elements and Architecture of Everything. And what it does is it takes these elements and then puts them together into molecules that it then turns into uh, salty things, sweet things, rubbery things, plastic things. Um, And when you're done the book, you realize he's described pretty much everything you've ever handled, touched in your life. And um, it really gives you an idea of how these 92 naturally Uh, occurring elements when put together in a soup, much like the perfume we were talking about earlier, uh, can create all kinds of things. And because of the molecules, uh, all those perfumes can be created, and the headphones I'm using can be created, uh, and everything else that we see here, touch, taste, or smell can be created. All right, so enough of that. Anyway, so thank you very, very much for joining us today for Mandy Aftel. Her book is Fragrant, The Secret Life of Scent, just published four days ago. We have it on the front table at the bookstore. Come and see us. And next week will be Theodore Gray, author of Molecules, The Elements and Architecture of Everything. You've been listening to The Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today. 